Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you today to our webinar on alternative therapies for colds and flus. I am Dr. Michelle Retz, the naturopath tech physician here at A New Aesthetics and Optimal Wellness, and I'm very excited to share my perspective on illness and healing, as well as give you some really practical tools that you can use from a natural practitioner's perspective for treating our colds and flu this season. So I thought I would start with, um, if I can get my slide presentation to go, <laughs> the old adage, and let me move my picture out of the way here for you. Um, feed a fever, starve a cold, or starve a cold, feed a, feed a fever. You remember these questions, starve a fever, feed a cold. What's the best thing that we can really do for ourselves when we're sick? I will answer the question up front. It is actually starve both. And I'll, I'll be discussing this as we go through. Um, but you know, from a naturopathic perspective, a cold is is not so much of an illness per se as more of the body's method of cleansing and detoxifying itself from a short-term state where toxins are building up in the body from a virus or a bacteria. It is an acute presentation of an internal disease state. Um, and by cleansing, I don't mean your typical detoxifying cleansing like you might think of, more so the cough, the runny nose, the achiness, the fever, the low appetite, even vomiting and di diarrhea can be considered cleansing or what we call exonerative discharges, the way the body is discharging and trying to get rid of that infectious material. So why do we end up getting so many colds and flu in the fall and the winter? Um, well, first of all, the drop in temperature is a big reason. The chill in the air, the lower temperatures actually cause our blood vessels to constrict and we're not as able to get rid of the toxins that are building up in our body through the skin, whether it's viruses or bacteria. And the next in line to do that are our liver and our gut. Uh, the next largest places where our immune system resides, liver and gut. So if they can't pick up the slack very well, those toxins will continue to circulate and reabsorb into the system and build and build and build over time. This slowly weakens the immune system and the body is just, you know, more prone to getting sick and not being able to mount that response and get rid of those toxins as well. Also, just when the temperatures are lower outside, the body does have to work harder to just maintain its typical body temperature, whether that's 98.6 or 97.8, whatever your normal body temperature is, it takes more energy to do that. And so what are some of the things that would preclude us to getting more toxin buildup or basically lead to decreased vitality? Like what are the things that we're doing that are working against ourselves, right? Uh, working too much, having a poor diet, depending on the time of year, might depend on what we're eating, you know, more so in the summer when it's hot, we're wanting a lot of ice cream and popsicles and sugary snacks. I will tell you sugar, any time of year that you are sick is the number one food ingredient that is worst for your immune health. Studies show that one teaspoon of sugar can decrease your white blood cell activity for five hours, just a teaspoon. So, you know, we want to be really careful when we are looking at maintaining our health to watch our sugar intake. You know, we're eating red meat and refined white bread, white rice. These are really inflammatory foods that don't help us have a healthy immune system. Soda, again, these sugars are acidic. They're not great for the tummy and they have sugar again. That's going to, you know, slow down our immune system. Lack of sleep. We fight illness and we grow and heal when we're in our sleep, in our REM state. So if we're not getting good sleep, it really is setting us up for illness stress, whether it's mental, emotional stress, being anxiety, overwhelm, worry, anger, or pain, physical stress, it takes away from our immune system's ability to fight anything else. If we are, you know, if we're in a stressed state, high cortisol actually can slow down our immune system over time. And if we're in pain, that's exhausting, but it also, we're using our immune system to heal and create inflammatory responses somewhere else. It's not able to mount such a response to viruses or bacteria. Nutrient deficiencies, whether it's not, you know, our soils just are depleted of good nutrients. We're not getting our multivitamin or we're not getting enough fruits and vegetables. We could be low in the nutrients that our white blood cells use specifically to kill viruses and bacteria. Vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E, selenium, all your B vitamins, zinc, magnesium, and your minerals. So it's really important to make sure we're getting those in daily. 
lack of hygiene. This is more, you know, on the extreme, but if we're not taking care of ourselves or picking up in our environment, we are precluding ourselves to either fungal or bacterial infections on our skin or within our body. Or actually, if, you know, there's food that's not getting picked up in our environment or mold in our environment, that's things, other things that are taxing our immune system and allowing toxins to keep building up so we can't actually just have a normal re immune response. Lack of fresh air and sunlight, like touching the earth, right? Uh, we're not getting as much vitamin D as we should. And vitamin D is really more like a hormone than it is just a vitamin. It definitely plays a huge role in how active our uh, healthy immune system is. And lack of exercise. All of these things can, um, you know, preclude us to getting sick. So is a fever a good or a bad thing? Depends on who you ask. <laughs> Truly, um, although it's uncomfortable, a fever is perfect in its application. The idea is that it's the body's vital force or energy working hard to kill a bug or eliminate a toxin. Bacteria and viruses live at 98.6 degrees. They don't live at 102 or 103. So some people, you know, it makes them nervous and they can feel like potentially a fever is a sign that we are not doing well um, and only get a fever when we're losing the battle of illness. And that is not the case. Our body really does make us feel achy, make us lose our appetite, make us have all that joint pain and soreness because it's trying to get us to stay down, to lie down and rest so that it can spend much needed energy fighting that infection. It is trying to stop you so that it can get you well. So again, just, you know, a good summary here, if you like a graphic, the fever really is working to ramp up our body temperature in order to slow down the bacteria and virus to help our immune system fight, give us a moment to increase our white blood cell numbers. That's called our acute phase response, right? And in the short term, that will help us recover faster. It actually protects the body and is not harmful up to about 104 degrees. Fevers are safe. Studies show that fevers are actually a good thing and even increase survival. Suppressing fevers with Tylenol or ibuprofen really increases our sick time and it increases our chances of becoming even more ill. There's common fears that my child's brain will boil if the fever gets too high or a fever seems just really dangerous in general. Brains do not boil and seizures really aren't a concern until the temperature gets into 105 or 106. Now, I'm not going to suggest that we let everyone just have 104 degree fever, but I just want you to have a healthy understanding of where we start to worry about seizures and serious, you know, other serious concerns from a temperature point of view versus where it's safe. Um, so safe versus dangerous fevers. And I do want to be very clear that no fever is an indication of how bad an illness is or isn't when it comes to little ones and the elderly. Toddlers will run around with a fever of 105 and you wouldn't even know it. While the elderly may not even make a fever and could be very seriously ill. So we really do wanna be careful to watch who we're taking care of and take this on an individual basis. I'm not making broad sweeping statements. Typically, though, a safe fever is around 102 or 103. And I put to comfort here because I, I don't want someone thinking that, you know, we need to maintain a fever at 103 because that's what's optimal for killing this bug if they're feeling miserable. Oftentimes around 103, 104 is where we start to feel really bad, really achy, really cold and shivery and just really, you know, the headache may be severe. So my advice is if you feel that you must use something to lower the temperature, but still try to maintain the fever, um, but keep them comfortable. So if we can keep a fever of 101 and give a little, you know, if we had to give Motrin or ibuprofen or something, we can lower the temperature so that we or the patient isn't feeling as bad, but we're still maintaining that temperature so that we can fight and stay sick for a shorter period of time. Um, it is, from my perspective, a good thing to get sick. And if you're my patients, you know, I say you want to get sick once a year. You want to know that your immune system is healthy enough for you to get sick once a year. And if you've known me for a little while, you'll know that I start to get nervous if it's been 10, 11 months and I haven't had a cold. And I don't mean bronchitis or pneumonia. I mean a cold, a good three to five day, just sniffles. I feel a little under the weather, cold, and I got past it and I was fine. It, I want to know that I'm healthy enough to amount a 
a simple immune response. And so when I start to get aches or chills or a runny nose, I go, oh, thank goodness, I'm all right. And then I'll start taking my herbs or my immune support and I'll know that I'm I'm healthy enough to have you know a robust immune response. So I do want you to look at yourself as being healthy enough to have a good cold at least once a year. Uh, so, you know, when when should you consider just seeing a healthcare provider or calling if you have questions about a fever? I think there's a really helpful graphic here. So if if someone's been sick and has had a fever that's come or gone for a week or more, typically if we're looking at, you know, just a cold, I mean, you should be well within seven days. So if if the fever has been intermittent and they're not continuing to get better, 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 that is time to talk to your practitioner. If someone has had a sore throat and a headache constantly for 48 hours, typically, you know, when we wake up with a sore throat, it is the worst in the morning, tends to be a little bit better as the day goes on, even if it is, you know, strep throat or something, you know, more serious, it still waxes and wanes through the day. And the headache um, could be a sign of something more serious because of typically a headache will come on as the temperature comes on and it can wax and wane, but it shouldn't stay as a constant fever for that 48 hours. It should wax and wane. So if it's not doing that, it is appropriate to call your doctor. In infants, we watch temperature very closely. So if an infant under three months has a temp over 100.3, 100.4, it's time to call and just watch with your doctor, as well as high fevers with earaches, because we're really worried about inner ear infections or rupturing of the um, the eardrum. Uh, so always, um, it's always okay to call if your child has a severe earache, they're, they're tugging on their ear, they're pulling on their ear, you're seeing discharge and they have a fever, it's definitely time to call. If someone has a temperature that stays at 103 or higher, despite you using Motrin or Tylenol or ibuprofen, it is definitely time to get them to the ER or call your healthcare provider because something more serious probably is going on. If someone is not acutely sick, they don't have a cold, they're not under the weather, and they're starting to have rises in temperature along with night sweats or swollen lymph nodes in the armpits or in the neck, uh, it's definitely time to call your practitioner to start to work that up. If they have a cough with the fever that's bringing up green, yellow, very brown or bloody mucus, this could be indicative of a serious bronchitis or pneumonia, something much more serious, probably time to call and consider getting some imaging and other things done. And if they've got vomiting or diarrhea along with the fever and that lasts longer than 12 hours, or if it is ever bloody at all, definitely call your physician. Most gastroenteritis, viral illnesses, stomach bugs, if you will, and even food poisoning, you know, should expend themselves within 12 to 24 hours. And so if that isn't tapering off at that 12 hour mark, we're very concerned about dehydration. We're also really concerned about the infection if things aren't slowing down. It's time to call and always call immediately if there's anything bloody coming out, whether it's top or bottom. And fevers that last more than 48 hours, as I said, fevers should wax or wane within a, you know, within a 24 hour period. It shouldn't stay 103 for 48 hours straight. And so if it does, it's time to talk to someone about, about what, the, what your next steps are. So could we be doing anything better then to treat ourselves, minimize our time? Could we get better faster? Common sense things that you already know are going to be very effective here. Um, and so typically I'll say the things that we use to treat ourselves go against the body's ability to heal itself. We're actually kind of shooting ourselves in the foot here while meaning well and trying to go about our lives. The over-the-counter medicines that we use to suppress our symptoms actually are suppressing our healing process. And so we feel better short term, but we end up making the illness last longer as a result. And this then drives the illness deeper into the body, which could cause bronchitis, some more serious sinus infection, pneumonia, or allow us to be sick just for weeks as a result, because we're dragging it out and we're trying to suppress our body's ability to just have a strong response, which makes us feel crummy, probably puts us down for a couple of days, but we'd be sick just for those few days rather than seven to 10 days, right? And so when we suppress with these medications, we are decreasing our immune systems immune factors and the way we respond and lack of being able to remove those toxins causes damage to more organ systems. It drives it deeper into the body. So some really simple things that you can do when you wake up that first morning and you're like, oh, I'm at like 90%, something's off. Am I getting sick? Do I feel 
that achy? Am I, is that, is that mucus? Is my throat hurt? You know, when you're just, you're not sure this is the time to start, you know, taking pro action and, and watching your diet. So I put some really simple things to be careful of diet wise, things that will drain your immune system, fried foods, refined sugar. I already talked about sugar being the number one thing to shut down your immune system for five hours soda and alcohol, refined carbs and processed foods, and red meat. So fried foods, white rice, white bread, processed foods, fast food, junk food, anything in a box, these really aren't nutritious. They're not going to have the vitamins and minerals that you need to fight. They're quite inflammatory. They're really devoid of nutrients, and they really are inflammatory. So they do not help us fight an infection. They, they create other problems that deter our immune system from doing what it needs to do. Uh, soda is one it has aspartame, acesulfame, some inflammatory sweeteners. It's very acidic. It's not good for the gut, which is where 70 to 80% of our immune system lives. Alcohol for the same reason as a toxin just damages the lining, but it also depletes our defenses. And really, um, we will mount a lot of our responses from our gut. And so if we're taking in foods or drink that are not good, we'll be damaging our immune system there and damaging our response to stay healthy. Red meat really is just inflammatory. And so I'll talk about some things that you can eat. If nothing else, it's just very inflammatory. It's not super helpful if you're feeling like you're getting under the weather. So how, what can help our immune system work harder? What can help us recuperate faster? And like I said, common sense things that you already know, this isn't going to be like genius material, but I do think it's worth repeating again. Um, and these are the most beneficial and effective things when you start to do them at the earliest signs that you're getting sick. If you're not hungry, don't eat. Not being hungry. Have you ever seen like your, your pet, your dog, your cat, you know, when they're under the weather, what do they do? They fast, they sleep, they go in the corner, they sleep for the whole day. They don't eat for a couple of days until they're well. Why? Because your body does not want to spend the energy digesting food. It needs that energy to fight. It wants to make a fever. It wants to make you feel achy. So you lay down and then it wants to kill that virus. And if you're eating against you because you're like, well, I should eat. I feel like I should eat. I'm really not hungry. You go ahead and eat. That food is going to just sit in your stomach. Your body's going to be like begrudgingly like, oh, okay, I guess I won't go over there and fight that thing. I guess I'll digest my food right now. And you're, you know, making it more likely that that illness is going to drag on. So if you're not hungry, respect your body, don't eat. As you get better um, and you do get hungry, please eat cleanly and lightly, meaning bras, soups, uh, white meat, fish. We talked about red meat being inflammatory. All white meat, turkey, chicken, fish, uh, plant-based proteins, all fine. Brown rice and quinoa. If you're going to do grains, do some whole grains and fruit, you know, lightly cooked steamed vegetables. Just keep it really simple, not a lot of food and only eat as you're hungry. And when you're full, stop eating because again, that's extra energy that your body's using to digest that food. Do make sure that you're staying hydrated with fluids, hot teas, water, whatever, it, um, you know, water, sparkling water, doesn't matter how you're doing that. But most importantly, um, our electrolytes, particularly when we're looking at fevers or any GI illness where we have vomiting or diarrhea, we're really worried about losing our electrolytes. If there's vomiting, we're worried about losing a lot of potassium. If there's diarrhea, we tend to lose a lot of magnesium. So those are two of the big ones that we really want to watch. I listed my two of my favorite electrolytes here, the Ultima electrolytes. That's a nice powder in many different flavors that you can get at Sprouts. You can order it online. Just one scoop once or twice a day is plenty for an adult. And Element -E, Element Packets, these are probably one of the most potent electrolytes I can find. You can order them online. Again, many flavors, one packet once or twice a day. They are excellent, very strong. So they really will make a difference in terms of how well you feel. If you're sweating a lot from having a fever or chills, or vomiting or diarrhea. The biggest thing we wanna do is make sure we stay hydrated. We would never suppress the body's illness, especially if it was GI related. We really just wanna support the body's ability to get that infection out. And to that end, I put, you might consider getting an IG, IV uh, for rehydration and for some of those electrolytes, particularly also with some nutrients that would ramp up the white blood cells ability to fight. And really we're just looking to keep you rehydrated through that process. If you're tired, please rest. Um, 
there's a study that shows that white blood cells or macrophages are actually increased 10 times if you just lay horizontal, not even if you're sleeping. If you're just, you're awake, you don't feel, you're reading, you're watching TV, you're just resting with your eyes closed, you're actually increasing your ability to fight the infection just by lying down. I would urge you to ignore the rat race message to just push through, take a medicine, and please give yourself the two or three days that you need to pause, heal, and recuperate. You will be much healthier, much faster. All right, so some other uh, recommendations I could offer you for boosting your immune support. Uh, one very easy preventative thing and great for children, infants, breastfeeding mothers is probiotics, right? So this is just feeding our good army in our gut. Because again, 70 to 80% of our immune system is in our gut. You want at least 20 billion a day in adults to be therapeutic. 20 to 100 billion is probably your therapeutic range for an acute illness like this, a cold, a flu, or a stomach bug. Um, and it's an easy way to preventatively just keep our immune system safe through cold and flu season. I did put that you do want to make sure that you take the probiotic with food, even if it says it's enteric coated and will get there all by itself. Studies do show you actually want to take the probiotic with food because more stomach acid is made when you make food, when you eat food, which makes more bicarbonate to neutralize um, the acid down in the small intestine. And that's what carries the probiotic down to the large intestine, right? So we not only want to feed the small, but also the large. We need to make sure it gets all the way down there. And eating food um, is the best way to do that. And um, while studies show... Some studies show there's no difference between refrigerating and not. It does seem to be a little more helpful to keep it refrigerated, but that isn't always practical, I realize, when you're traveling. So it's okay if it says it, it's shelf stable. That's all right. More important I would care about is that you take it with food. So for little ones, um, breastfeeding mothers can take the probiotic and get it into their milk. You can open up the capsules, put it in the bottle. You can put it in yogurt, applesauce, you know, whatever else you're able to feed the child um, or yourself. Definitely probiotics are indicated if you're having a gut issue, an acute stomach bug, food poisoning, something like that. Uh, Saccharomyces particularly is the probiotic that has been shown in studies to clear up acute diarrheas very quickly. All the probiotics do benefit, but if someone's having diarrhea, child or adult, you definitely want to use um, Saccharomyces. And I did put a caution here to not take Saccharomyces if you have Crohn's disease, because that can actually aggravate the immune system. System. It is a yeast naturally found in the gut, but in Crohn's, it actually stimulates the immune system and could aggravate the uh, Crohn's. So be careful there. And like I said, you could open it into water, applesauce. If there isn't any mucus or phlegm, you could do it in yogurt. Dairy's very phlegm producing. So I caution you, if you're having a lot of discharge or thick, sticky discharge, you probably want to lay off the dairy and maybe put it in just some applesauce or water. A good probiotic will tell you how many billion is on the label. It won't say 500 milligrams. It'll say 10 billion lactobacillus and 10 billion bifidobacter. I put these on this screen so that you can can see lactobacillus is the main bug in the small intestine and bifidobacter is the main bug in the large intestine. You want a 50-50 ratio, whatever that number is, you just want to equally treat the large intestine and the small intestine. So it should be able to tell you how much of each is in there. You want at least 20 billion and you want to be taking it with food. What nutrients help our white blood cells fight the most? And I think um, I'm so pleased that there's been so much education during the pandemic that y'all know so much now about how to boost your immune system. So hopefully this just seems like a review, but there's a lot of information on these slides because I want this to be really informative and useful so that you can slow down, take pictures and write this down. So I apologize that the, the, <laughs> the slides are busy, but that's just for your benefit. Um, as I mentioned before, ACEs, you could think in your mind, ACEs, vitamin vitamin A, vitamin C, E, and selenium. These are a great place to start for both adults and kids. All the dosing I'm going to talk about here is for adults. With some of these nutrients, we need to be careful with dosing for children. So please make sure you talk to your provider first. Vitamin A in adults, a healthy range for acute dosing when you're sick is 100,000 to 200,000 IUs. 
daily. It's a fatty vitamin. So I said, you do want to take it with a little bit of food or you want it in an oil-based solution. A lot of the ones that are droppers already come in an oil. So you don't have to worry about taking it with food because most of the time when we're sick, we don't want to eat. Um, and I would stay at that dose for no longer than a month. If you are just treating an acute illness, it should take more, no more than one or two weeks anyway. Uh, but long-term vitamin A high doses can be associated with a headache. So just watch if you get a headache, your dose is probably a little too high and you need to back down. Vitamin C is probably one of the most various vitamins. Our need for vitamin C increases immensely when we are sick. It is tremendous how much vitamin C we can actually take into our cells without any aggravation when we're fighting a bacteria or a viral illness. Um, and you may have played along with this during COVID because we were learning about the doses. Uh, I say to bowel tolerance, which means take as much as you can until you start to get loose stool and then back off. The loose stool is a sign that you're finally not absorbing any more you've reached your capacity, you'll be quite amazed at how much vitamin C you can take. It is perfectly fine for an adult to take 2000 milligrams every two hours. The first couple of days, they're feeling very sick. I'll tend to take about 20,000 a day orally. Um, I would say a good measure is five to 10,000 a day. I'll usually tell my patients seven to 10,000 milligrams a day in divided doses. You're not doing that all at once. The easiest way to get that in is either in the thousand milligram tablet or chewables, or to use a buffered vitamin C powder. You definitely do not just want to get an ascorbate powder. Vitamin C does not taste good. So um, they buffer it with minerals for flavor to taste. So do make sure if you're getting it over the counter that it says buffered vitamin C. Most of those are about 4,000 milligrams a scoop. So you could do one scoop in the morning, one scoop in the evening. That's 8,000. That's a really excellent dose right there. Um, I did put emergency, you know, a lot of, it does have a little sugar in it, which I don't love, but it is, you know, an easy packet and in, in flavors. So if you have little ones, it's an easy way to get that in. You could also do the powder. Um, vitamin E, uh, vitamin E, it's a great antioxidant, but it restores glutathione and helps us detox. So vitamin E, probably 400 um, I use uh, daily with food. It's again, it's a fatty vitamin. So you'll want to take it with a little bit of fat if you can. Selenium also really great for ramping up the immune system, 200 to 400 micrograms a day. That's one or two capsules a day. Zinc, y'all have learned about zinc through the pandemic. Um, it is a great immune booster. It has a narrow therapeutic window. I would say for an adult, 50 to 100 milligrams is fine. Now as a metal, it absolutely has to be taken with food or it will cause nausea and vomiting. So please really only take zinc. You could take it preventatively if you're definitely with a meal, if you're eating, but when you, if you're too sick to eat, zinc is not going to be something that you're going to be taking you know, because it will, it will aggravate nausea or vomiting. So if you can't take it with food, please don't take it. And then vitamin D, uh, you can really do a single dose, one-time dose of a high dose of vitamin D shown to be incredibly antiviral, immune boosting, and antibacterial. And so you need to figure out how much your weight is in kilograms, and then you dose 10,000 IUs for however many kilograms. So about, you know, if I'm, say, I'm 55,000 IUs, basically, or something like that. So I would do 55 1,000 drops one time on a spoon. I would take that one dose, I'd be done for the day. The next day, I'd go back to my regular dosing, right, of 5,000 I use a vitamin D a day. So you can do a one-time single dose for a huge immune boost, but do make sure that you know how to figure out your weight in kilograms in order to do that. And I just put a little graphic down in the bottom of, I always want food to be our medicine too. So when we're talking about these vitamins, if you are, you know, whether it's just being preventative or if you're finally starting to feel well, like I said, eat cleanly, we'll pick the brightly colored foods because they're going to be chock full of vitamin C, vitamin A is on, on that beta carotene, carrots, sweet potatoes, yams, vitamin E, right? Bananas, lemons, broccoli, spinach, avocados, and liver um, and fish are high sources of vitamin D. So- Always let food be your medicine. So now we're going to talk about some great therapies that we have here in the office as well. Um, we've talked a lot about glutathione. You'll hear it as the, the, you know, the body's master detoxifier. It protects us from oxidative damage. It helps us 
processed solvents and heavy metals and all of those good things, helps us cleanse and detox. Now we're looking at it for acute illness. So a nebulizer is a machine, you're probably familiar, that turns a liquid medicine into a mist that can be easily and comfortably inhaled without causing any irritation. Particularly good for upper respiratory and lower respiratory infections where we want to get something into the sinus cavities and down into the lungs. So when we're looking at using glutathione to get into the sinus cavities and down into the lungs, we're looking to protect the lungs from oxidative damage with toxicity and balance cellular function, right? So um, as a detoxification antioxidant, the places that glutathione is the highest are in the lungs, the liver, the thyroid, the brain, and the skin. So this is a really wonderful treatment that we can do when we have a lung infection. And it also, you know, will help these other parts of the body as well. But particularly when we're sick, most of it's going to concentrate in the lungs. It has some sulfur compounds that help us detox and specifically helps us get rid of mucus. Thick, sticky mucus that's really hard to get out. It helps thin it and it helps the body get rid of it. It's really great for acute and chronic chest congestion particularly spastic coughs where we're having a trouble catching our breath or we're having shortness of breath from inflammation in general. That could be from asthma, bronchitis, pneumonia. It could be acute COVID. I've treated long COVID um, where it's, you know, settled in the chest and folks are having shortness of breath or the cough just won't let up. That's the one thing that's, you know, that's stayed when all the other symptoms left. Cystic fibrosis. We do need to be careful with COPD, um, but it is great with lung fibrosis as well because it helps where there is anytime there's thick mucus that is hard to get out. We're having spastic coughs that can't seem to settle down and we're having trouble breathing as a result of all that inflammation and spasm. I just wanted to put a caution at the bottom of this slide to please not nebulize essential oils. They are far too harsh and concentrated and they can cause a lung spasm. So while we'll talk about diffusing and using steam inhalations and other applications of essential oils, please do not put it in the nebulizer. You do not want that going right down into the lungs um, in that concentration. Okay. Next is ozone. Um, there are, you've probably heard us talk a lot about ozone here as well. Um, it is a wonderful gas that we use for all kinds of applications. So this graphic here is just showing you all of the different ways in which we can apply ozone to the body. If you didn't know, we can apply it topically to dramatically increase, increase wound healing. We can do it rectally for Crohn's disease, colitis, ulcerative colitis, celiac disease. We can get it into the lungs and treat lung disease. We can put it into the nasal sinuses to treat chronic sinus infections. We can dentists use it to treat periodontitis and abscesses. Uh, we can inject it into joints and help with pain and inflammation from arthritis and other disease conditions. We can use it vaginally to treat infections. We can put it in our ears for ear infections. We can drink it as water. I mean, just about any way you can think about it, we can get it in, right? Now, ozone by itself as a gas is O3. Oxygen is O2. Ozone is O3. It is harmful if it is directly inhaled and if you're exposed to it for long periods of time. Medical ozone is different and is used specifically for fighting disease, treating infection and inflammation. It upregulates our immune system wherever it goes to a positive benefit. It upregulates our white blood cells, our ability to fight and our ability to have a healthy inflammatory response. It is one of the best, quickest and most effective ways to kill both locally as well well as systemically because it's a gas. So it's going to go right where we put it. And then over time, it will slowly diffuse through the body and have those added benefits wherever it goes, which is just, it's such an added second benefit. More, It's more readily absorbed as a gas, and it's wonderful because it can skip the GI tract. If we need to, we can get it in other ways. If a tummy's not working well, someone's on medications like acid blockers where they don't absorb well, um, or they're having GI illness or medications that decrease absorption, it's a wonderful way to, we can bypass the gut, we can get it in IV, we can do it in breathing treatments or nasal treatments, and we don't have to worry about that. Especially if we're feeling nauseous, then we don't have to, you know, it's not something that you have to take in through the mouth. And that's really helpful when you're not feeling well. So you'll see ozone therapies are antiviral, antibacterial, antifungal, antiparasitic. We use it to treat Lyme disease, uh, mold toxicity. It treats inflammation from allergies, acute and chronic sinus infections, 
upper and lower respiratory infections, poison ivy, autoimmune disease, rashes on the skin, and wounds that won't heal. Uh, it is just truly one a very simple and effective treatment on so many levels. So I put the benefits on the side for you there. Uh, like I said, it upregulates and improves our immune response wherever we put it. It does help remove toxins as an antioxidant and enhance metabolism. It brings blood flow to the area wherever it's introduced. And guess what's floating around in the blood? Our immune system, right? So that's partially how it upregulates things is because it increases circulation to the area of the problem. And it helps uh, bring oxygen to the tissues. When oxygen, when cells have more oxygen, they function better. So we're just we're just swimming, bathing them in oxygen to help them function better. And you'll see it helps treat musculoskeletal disorders because it stimulates repair. It decreases inflammation, which means it's great for arthritis, injury, and any joint inflammation. It's truly just a wonderful therapy. So we'll talk about two specific ozone treatments that we use. The first being intranasal ozone or what it's called nasal insufflation. And we use this to decrease sinus pressure uh, decrease inflammation in the nasal passages. The difference between glutathione and ozone is that ozone kills infections. Glutathione helps with the, you know, helps with spasm, helps with thick, sticky mucus, shortness of breath, and it protects the lungs, but it doesn't kill anything. So if you know you have an infection, ozone will be your best friend for acute and chronic sinus infections, like I said, upper and lower respiratory infections, bronchitis, as well as asthma and allergies. So what to expect? So you could see on the last slide, the gal had just a nice a syringe just filled with ozone and gently was injecting it into the nasal sinus cavities. We are not breathing in ozone. These treatments are done while holding your breath. So, and you will exhale after the treatment. So you'll never be breathing in ozone gas, but the gas will be um, dissolving or diffusing through your sinus cavities into your eustachian tubes and your ears and killing everything, you know, anything infectious that's along the way. So uh, it's a very quick and easy treatment, very gentle. You don't really feel anything, but after you exhale, it's very common because it stimulates an immune response to have increased nasal secretions, you know, a little bit of a runny nose in the five to 15 minutes or 20 minutes following treatment. And that will subside. Uh, you may smell chlorine or you may smell the ozone gas temporarily for just a minute or two. You could notice a slight tingling or burning sensation. It's very mild. That also goes away within a few minutes. And then your symptoms start to improve. It is safe enough for adults or children to do once a day, as many days as needed until they're better, which is really wonderful. And then we have an ozone breathing treatment, um, and I'll show you what that looks like on the next slide. But first, I just wanted to review some risk factors that, you know, for us, for respiratory disease, things to think about when we're looking at being preventative or considering our exposure and trying to stay healthier through the cold and flu season. So allergies. So anytime your body's already busy uh, dealing with an immune, you know, having inflammation or finding allergies, it has a, you know, you're at an increased risk for getting other infections. Overweight isn't just it's not a link between overweight, but it's really the diet that accompanies being overweight, which is lower in nutrients that feed the white blood cells and help protect your immune system. Eating more, you know, refined white processed foods, junk food, sugary foods, things that slow down the immune system also predispose you to infection. If you're frequently exposed to pollutants, obviously this makes sense, tobacco or cigarette smoke. If you have recurrent lung infections and this is, you know, your weak spot, you're going to be prone to having chronic respiratory issues, as well as if you're exposed to dust, asbestos, fumes, inhaled chemicals, um, antibiotics, certain chemotherapies and other medications can also increase our risk, uh, such as, you know, for a lot of medications used for autoimmune disease that suppress the immune system do put us at risk for infection. So we really need to be careful. And then there are some diseases that do have a genetic component to them, like cystic fibrosis. So again, just reminding you, so you can see here in the picture, this is a breathing treatment. So this is a little bit different. So the ozone machine will be introducing the gas into an oil. It will not be breathed in directly. And then the particles are breathed in through a cannula through the nose here, just like as if you were breathing in oxygen. Um, and again, this is used to kill infections, viral, bacterial, fungal in the lungs. And it brings oxygen, it increases blood flow and decreases inflammation into the lungs. 
also is also treating a little bit of the sinus passages as you're breathing it in. Again, just a reminder, we're not breathing in ozone directly. It's getting diffused through an oil first. This is usually a 30 to 45 minute treatment, most often 30 minutes. It's very comfortable and you're just breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth for the duration of the time. And it's safe to do as often as every other day. This one we don't do every day. We can do it as often as every other day, children or adults. Incredibly, incredibly effective. <laughs> Um, there are a few things to watch out for, um, like contraindications for ozone therapy. So if you're pregnant, we don't want any antioxidants running around with the fetus in the body. Uncontrolled hyperthyroidism. So there was a study that in mice that showed that when they put them in a hyperthyroid state, they were much more prone to ozone-induced lung toxicity. They don't know why. So if you're, it's not a contraindication if your hyperthyroidism is managed, it's if it's uncontrolled. So just be careful with these. These are, you know, caveats and cautions, but everything is a conversation. Um, ozone is a blood thinning therapy. So we really want to be careful in conditions like anemia, uh, thrombocytopenia, which is where we have low platelets, um, or deficiencies in the blood that cause us like a stroke. If we just had a stroke or if, you know, if we're on blood thinners, things like that, we want to be careful. So, um, it's a caution, <laughs> always a conversation with your provider. G6PD deficiency. This is an enzyme in the red blood cells that helps them make glutathione. And when it is not present, they don't make glutathione and the blood cells lies or break open. And um, this hasn't this is controversial because there ha there are any studies that show that people with G6PD deficiency uh, could theoretically have increased lysing or breaking open of the red blood cells. Um, what's interesting is the Italian physician, Dr. Bacci in Italy, where he's done thousands of ozone, you know, IV treatments and where G6PD deficiency is very common, hasn't reported any um, adverse events and he's not testing folks for this deficiency. So there's not one case reported, but theoretically it could happen. So if you are concerned, you can always get a simple blood test to see if you have the G6PD deficiency and whether or not that would be a concern for you. Obviously, as with anything else, if you have an allergy to ozone, if you've been exposed and you had an allergic response, this would not be ideal for you. Um, there is a caution with folks who have high blood pressure taking ACE inhibitors, things like captopril, lisinopril, enalapril, all of those medications will end with PRIL on the end of them or IL on the end of them um, because it can increase the hyper responsiveness in the lungs, which means it could actually increase spasm and closing down of the lungs. So you really should consult your physician first before doing a breathing treatment if you're on an ACE inhibitor. And I mentioned the stroke because there's usually an increased risk for bleeding. Um, and so it's a blood thinning therapy. So we want to be careful there. I'm going to switch gears and go to botanical medicine and some herbs now that you can use to kill viral bacterial infections as well as boost your immune system. Um, ideally, when we use herbs, we want to use something that treats the general site of illness, which means if you had a sinus infection, you wanna use some herbs that are specific to the sinuses, right? Or if you have a cough or a sore throat, you wanna use some herbs that are specific for treating the throat or the lungs addressing the cough, breathing, spasm. And then you want something that generally supports the immune system that rubs up all of your white blood cells and helps you fight better in general. So that's usually how I approach treating illness. Um, there are hundreds of wonderful herbs that could be on this page, too many to count, and I'll have some pictures on the next pages. So forgive if I miss something, but I really did want to point out very common herbs you're likely to see on the label. I want you to be able to point them out and understand, oh, that's antiviral or, oh, that's in here because it's used to fight bacterial infections. Or if you're trying to look for something in the aisle that you know what you're looking for, or that these herbs and names start to make sense to you. So great antiviral herbs, and it's not one more than the other. I tend to use blends because herbs as constituents, um, the, you know, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So really, I like to use them all together. They're synergistic. Uh, St. John's wort, you know of St. John's wort, which is called hypericum for depression, but it is a very potent antiviral herb. Melissa, uh, licorice, which is also called glyceriza, lomatium, logusticum, oregano, and garlic you'll see in more than one place would definitely kill viruses. Astragalus, or milk vetch, as it's called. Cat's claw, elderberry. You guys know of elderberry for the flu. It is very specific for the flu. Olive leaf, 
grapefruit seed extract, and there are many, many, many more, but these are just some of my favorites. Um, antimicrobial herbs, those that are used to kill bacterial infections, should hopefully some of these should look familiar to you. Echinacea. And echinacea does have an antiviral component as well, but it definitely, uh, I would say, is a very strong antibacterial herb. Or organ grape root, golden seal, garlic, and oregano. You'll see them both here as well. Both great for viruses and bacteria. Grapefruit seed extract, also in both categories. Usnea, um, uva ursi, and there are many more, but these are very common ones that you should see on the label. And it's nice when we can use things that are in both categories because then we can be efficient or cover both of our bases if we're not sure what we're fighting early on. And when you're using herbs for adults, a dose that I'll usually recommend is two droppers every two hours in a little water on the first day. And that's like the loading dose, right, of herbs. If you were taking a loading dose of an antibiotic, this is the same. We're going to take it every two hours, not when you're sleeping, so not if you take a nap, not during the night, but every two hours when you're awake. And then the next days that you're sick, about every four hours, about four times a day in a little bit of water. And I'll say until you're better, plus one or two days. So it's like if you were taking an antibiotic, you finish the bottle. You don't stop taking it the second you start feeling better. You finish the bottle. Same thing with the herbs. You go for a day or two after you feel well, just to make sure you fully flushed out that bug, whatever it is. I love these graphics. Um, there's, you know, a lot of these we've already talked about on the last page. So just depending on whether you like a picture or you like words, I gave you both. Um, on the left, we have immune enhancing herbs. And on the right, we just have herbs that are good for the immune system. So there are herbs that just by nature kill viruses and bacteria. And there are herbs that modulate the immune system, right? That can tamper down our inflammatory aspects and rev up the ones that we need to fight acute infection. And a lot of these should look familiar. You'll see black elder, that's elderberry or Sambucus niger. Um, really excellent for the flu particularly. So when we're using this, yes, it is antiviral, but it also is particularly specific for the flu. Oregon, oregano here. I mean, oregano, sorry, not Oregon, thinking Oregon grapefruit. Garlic, turmeric, just nice and anti-inflammatory. Cat's claw, that wonderful antiviral. Um, Eleuthero, echinacea, and astragalus, um, really great immune modulating properties. And over here, a lot of, you'll see the mushrooms, shiitake, cordyceps, reishi, many of these mushrooms also have immunomodulating capabilities, which means they can boost up certain healthy parts and calm down other um, more inflammatory, problematic parts of our immune system. And over time can cause um, chronic health of the immune system, like deep health of the immune system. So we can become more healthy over time, right? Less prone to illness in general. But a lot of these should look familiar. I'm trying to see if there's anything else I haven't pointed out. Thyme also we'll talk about is a wonderful antimicrobial herb that we can use uh, in steam inhalations and humidifiers. Great for the sinuses, the upper respiratory infection. Lemongrass is Melissa, that wonderful antiviral herb. Picoriza is a wonderful Ayurveda herb. We use it, oh my gosh, in so many properties, but it's antiviral, antibacterial, use it for the GI as well. Blessed thistle is milk thistle. So just again, helping with inflammation, with detoxification in the liver. Um, elderberry, again, you'll see a lot of these. And andrographis is a wonderful Chinese herb we use for bacterial infection. So there's a lot of good out there. I just want to start you becoming familiar with some of these terms and some of what they look like. You may or may not have heard of this. This is a good old home remedy called the onion poultice. And I can move my picture here, um, but I have a little graphic here on how to make an onion poultice at home. So a poultice is anytime we're applying an herb topically, right? Whether it's for drawing properties, drawing a wound or a boil outside of the skin or treating an infection or inflammation, it's a topical application. So um, onions, actually called Allium sepa, that's its herbal botanical name. Um, um, we've learned a lot about quercetin through the pandemic. You guys should, you know, know it's very anti-inflammatory. We use a lot for allergies in, and histamine, you know, blocking. Um, and it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful bioflavonoid, but onion in general has a lot of other flavonoids that are anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial to kill bacterial infections, and they help with pain. So this poultice is really great for ear infections and ear pain, upper respiratory and lower respiratory infections, and the pain just from having infection or from the cough. 
And so um, very, very simple. I'll tend to use red onion. You can certainly use a white onion or yellow onion. Um, you cut it in half or cut it into many pieces. You can see here, you can cook it many different ways. You could bake it on low in the oven for about 20 minutes. You could cook it on the stove top till it's warm. You could do the microwave. That would be the least preferred way just because you're killing nutrients in the microwave. The bioflavonoids, the quercetin that we want tend to get denatured in a microwave. So try not to do it that way unless you have to. And then you've chopped it all up, you dry it, um, pat it dry on a towel, and then you can see, place it in some cheesecloth or a thin, clean towel, wrap that up, and then you can apply it to the ear. So you can have the child sick, or if you're sick, lie down on the healthy ear, put the poultice right on the ear and just leave it there for about 20 minutes. It's really soothing to the ear. The heat helps with the pain, and all of those bi bioflavonoids are diffusing down into the ear, really helps with the infection. Likewise, you can place it on the chest or on the back um, when someone's having a bad cough. And I've known mothers to do this, but to put it into the into the bath. They'll put either put the baby in the bath or the child in the bath and put the poultice on their chest or just put the onion actually in the bath water if they don't have any skin conditions and that doesn't bother. So it's another way that you could do it. And again, a treatment's about 20 minutes, but this is a really easy, effective home remedy that you can use. All right. Steam inhalations. Um, so these are, you know, just tried and true home, you know, home remedies. I just want to bring to your attention if we're not using them or thinking about them. These are really great for infants, children, upper and lower respiratory infections, sinus infections, colds and flus, right? So this is, you know, you're adding three or four drops of an essential oil. Great essential oils to use for upper and lower respiratory infections are eucalyptus, uh, lavender, just for inflammation, oregano, lemongrass, clary sage. You can use thyme. Um, sometimes it's a little bit spicy, I guess I would say, and sometimes that can aggravate upper respiratory like coughs. So I'd be careful with thyme, although it is a very, very strong antimicrobial and antiviral essential oil. Just be careful if you're using thyme not to use too much. And add three or four drops of those to a bowl of hot water. Cover yourself in the bowl with a towel as she's doing here and breathe deeply. I would alternate if you can, breathing deeply through your nose and then deeply through your mouth. So we wanna get it into the sinus passages and then down into the chest. Of course, if you're congested, just breathe through your mouth. Um, and just be careful to keep yourself at a distance so you're getting the heat, but you're not burning your face. Um, for babies or children that can't support themselves, I would say no towel. Please just have them breathe. I would put the bowl in a sink and lean them over the sink and have them breathe it in. Or you can put the essential oils or the bowl in the shower, obviously, and have them breathe deeply that way. And this is just a really great way to get antimicrobial essential oils down into the chest. Likewise, um, you could also use a humidifier with distilled water, so sterile water and add some essential oils to it as well. Same essential oils, or you can use the, you know, um, if you've got the diffusers, it's a little bit gentler of a treatment because you've got these great essential oils just in the air. Here, we want more of a direct application. We're really trying to get it down into the lungs in a therapeutic dose. So it's a little bit closer, more up in the face. I would do that twice a day, morning and evening until you're better. Other things to think about, um, nasal rinses or the neti pot and lymphatic massage. So nasal rinses or using the neti pot is one of the best ways for getting back in this ethmoid sinus here. There's so few things that can get up in there and that's the one that's connected to the eustachian tube. So when folks are having ear congestion and chronic sinus issues and their ears are pop or they're full and there just isn't any medicine that they're taking that's getting back there and doing the job, the neti pot and some lymphatic massage could be very powerful for for getting back in there. Um, it is one of the few things that also can just wash out the sinuses, right? So we're literally just flushing things out, which makes it antiviral, antibacterial, and antifungal. Um, I personally love to use grapefruit seed extract in liquid form. Please don't taste it in liquid form. It is awful. Um, there are capsules when we <laughs> when we use it to treat other things. But for the sinus passages, if you're my patient, you'll know, I'll always recommend three or four drops of liquid grapefruit seed extract. And you can get this at Sprouts or online. Um, and then rinse each side of your nasal passages. So rinse one side with half the bottle, give a good blow, and then rinse the other side with the other half of the bottle, give a good blow. And do that twice a day, morning and evening. And that really helps get in there, you know, 
um, with just getting into those sinuses and getting, you know, the grapefruit seed extract finally getting back where some medicines just are having trouble. Um, lymphatic massage can be a great option anytime you have congestion, swollen lymph nodes, sore throat. It's wonderful for literally anything in the face and the neck. Um, and so I'll show you some simple ways to do that. It's also great if you can't use an eddy pot. Some folks get so inflamed, they can't get anything in there. This is a nice way to gently massage and move the lymph, drain the fluid out of the head, the ears, the neck, down into the, you know, we get rid of it in our chest. So we're helping drain the head and the neck. Um, it's really great for literally any infections up here. So eye infections, ear infections, sinus, you know, just a cold where you're stuffy and congested and your lymph nodes are swollen and your th sore throat, it hurts to swallow. Really wonderful for that. So I'll show you both of these things in a moment. So this is a really easy graphic on how to do a nasal rinse. Um, of course, there's no wrong way, but really whatever form of, you know, bottle that you're using is totally fine. They'll usually come with the salts. That's just to keep it uh, like a saline solution so that it doesn't bother the body at all. So I would encourage you to use saline, the saline powder, or the little salts that come with it and mix that in the bottle. You want to use room temperature water. You don't want to use too hot or too cold. Too cold will constrict the blood vessels and close everything off. Too hot causes more inflammation. So really neutral temperature. And you want to lean forward over your sink and either squeeze or tip the water so it starts draining down your nose. You want to lean forward enough that it should drain outside of your nose into the sink. If it starts draining down your throat, you just need to lean forward a little bit more. It should not hurt. It shouldn't be uncomfortable at all. You're just going to feel the sensation of the water dripping through, creating that nice flushing motion. Um, and then you'll do, like I said, half of the neti pot or nasal rinse on one side. Give a good blow in a tissue and then repeat on the other side and do that morning and evening. This is, uh, I, I always like to give you a graphic, but I'll show you how I do lymphatic massage on my patients. If you're a patient, there's a good chance I've done this on you in the office. This is a wonderful thing you can do preventatively. You could do this on an airplane or in your car, you know, right when you wake up that one day and you're like, oh, am I starting to get a little something? Um, if you've been around someone who's sick or if you are really just ill, this is a nice thing to do to drain the sinuses, drain the ears, the eyes, and the lymph nodes. Um, so our lymph nodes are are all around our face in a circle. I tend to start top to bottom just so that I, you know, remember so that I don't forget anything, but it's all connected. It really doesn't matter what order you go in, as long as you just do your best to remember, you know, try to hit all the areas. Um, so I'll start above my eyes over the sinuses with just a moderate pressure. You don't really need to press hard and you're rubbing across the sinuses down to your jaw, right where your jaw meets that TMJ Junction right there, about five times. You're gonna rub about five times. And then you're gonna rub from your jaw down the back of this muscle in your neck. You have lymph nodes that run right down the back of that muscle. So about five times you're gonna run from your jaw. This will get very repetitive, so you should be able to remember it. And then you pump five times on the collarbone because our lymphatic system drains into our lungs. And so when we gently pump on that, it's creating a light pulling action, draining everything down. This will get repetitive as we go. So I won't, I won't belabor the, all the pictures, but I would do it over the eyes to the jaw five times and then five times down the neck. I would do it under the eyes to the jaw five times and then five times down the neck and pump. I would do it under the cheeks five times, five times under the neck, and then pump. I would do it along the jawline up to the TMJ here, five times, and five times behind your neck, and then pump five times. Under the chin, this is really good if you have sore throat, and right down the back of the neck, five times for each of those, and then pump. And then we're going around the ears and down the back of the neck. That one feels really nice around the ears, down the back of the neck, five times and then pump. And then um, from the back of the head here, right where those muscles attach to the back of your neck, where it always feels so good to get a massage, pull forward and down the back of the neck five times. Your ears can actually drain all the way back here. You have lymph nodes all the way back there. So if someone has a really bad ear infection or really bad ear congestion and then pump five times. That can be super helpful. And that is a wonderful thing that you can do literally anytime. I will do it in the car. My kids love it. It's gentle for babies and children. Um, it'll 
you'll start draining if there's anything to drain within about 10 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes of having done that. And I find it lasts about three or four hours. So it is, you know, it is, you do need to do it more than once a day, but it is a quick, easy thing you can do literally anywhere that just helps you keep processing all the discharges that are coming out in a healthy way. All right. Infrared sauna, one of my favorites. Um, this is a really simple modality um, that's very effective for treating illness and helping you have a really good immune response. The idea here is that we're using infrared sauna, not sweat to death sauna. Infrared sauna goes up to usually about 135 degrees, but it doesn't feel hot. It's a dry heat. And we do have a little bit of a detox process that's happening, but really the benefit of sauna here for illness is that we're warming the body temperature up to about 102 degrees. Again, we're kind of simulating a fever. So in folks whose body temperature remains low or who don't mount much of a response. This is a wonderful way for them to get their body temperature up to help kill the infection. And it's a great thing to do at the early sign of illness to really help turn the tide or prevent you from getting sick altogether. You do have a little bit of detoxification through the skin. Infrared sauna really targets the fat under the dermis where we keep our solvents and heavy metals, that kind of thing. So we are detoxing a little bit. We're also revving up our temperature. It does help open up the airways so that heat and steam help open up our sinus passages and our chest. If you're sick, I like to recommend that you put an herbal chest rub on the chest, on the back, or on the upper lip, and that you breathe that throughout the treatment as well. When I recommend sauna for acute illness, I'll recommend that you do usually three rounds of treatment. You're sitting for about in the heat for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then you do a 30 to 60 second cold rinse, either a little shower or take a cold washcloth and just rinse your skin off to get to rinse off, right? The toxins that you're getting out, go ahead and sit back in there for 10 or 15 minutes again. And then a quick 30 to, sec 30 to 60 second rinse with cold water chilled water, not ice cold water. You want it to be, you know, you're getting a hydrotherapy response. It doesn't need to be like freezing cold water. <laughs> and then do that again, 10 or 15 minutes of the heat and end with the cold rinse. Sauna is safe enough for you to do every day. Just once a day is fine. You do not need to do it multiple times a day, but please just make sure that you replenish your electrolytes after the sauna because you do sweat a little bit um, and you will lose magnesium, potassium, calcium, sodium. So um, if anyone doesn't feel well after the sauna, it's usually because they one, they've revved up their immune response and they're getting ready to fight the bug. They also could be low in electrolytes. So use the Ultima or the element electrolytes that I mentioned earlier on the days that you do the sauna. And this is just a nice little graphic again, just mentioning that we are raising our core body temperature up to 102. A really great therapy. And last but not least, how can we not talk about COVID. <laughs> um, you guys have been, you know, well informed, I would imagine over the last few years. So I hope that what's on these slides isn't a ton of new information, but we do have to talk about it. Uh, because what we're seeing is COVID variants are now playing with all the other coronaviruses and colds and flus that are out there. So we're seeing some you know, cousins and I would say <laughs> variants of the illness that are mild, definitely milder, don't not as intense, don't last as long, but can still have some of the significant symptoms um, that could remind you of your infection with COVID. That might be the way that you tell. The testing really isn't great. I'd say it's only about 40% accurate and it only tends to show up in these variants days five through seven. By that time, you're pretty much you know, on your way to over the cold, you're convalescing anyway. So I think we're missing a lot of it um, because the testing is, is just not able to pick it up as it's blending with other viruses. Um, a lot of the antiviral herbs that we talked about are really good for boosting your immune system and killing the virus. There are some herbs and um, natural treatments that are specific for COVID that I've listed here. Um, on the FLCCC, the frontline critical care docs, the ER docs, um, and they've been doing studies all throughout these years. They're a great resource for you if you want to check them out. But nigella, black cumin, um, just one 500 milligram cap twice a day was shown to be really effective against COVID. Neem, neem oil is antimicrobial, antiviral, antifungal. We use it in the gut. It also seems to be really effective against COVID. I'd say probably one cap twice a day. Uh, garlic, which we mentioned earlier, it was both antiviral, antimicrobial, antifungal. Well, this is a virus. 
virus. So it really um, has allium sativum is the name, but garlic has been shown to be helpful and thyme as well, thymus vulgaris. So I'll add that to formulations, particularly for COVID. Um, all the antiviral herbs that we reviewed would be helpful for you. So you can get a nice blend and dose like we talked about. Um, and specific nutrients, you, you may or may not already know this, but vitamin C, you want at least 10,000 milligrams a day. Vitamin D, you want at least 10,000 milligrams a day. These are adult doses. These talk to your healthcare provider for children's doses, please. Uh, zinc, as a reminder, um, if you're go if you're eating food, right, you can have zinc. If you're not eating, please don't take zinc. It'll aggravate the nausea and vomiting. But 75 to 100 milligrams a day. So I would break that up probably into at least two or three doses. Um, ivermectin still has, it's been controversial, but it still shows to be incredibly effective against the virus and even in long haulers. So that is definitely something we're recommending. Quercetin, we talked about quercetin coming from onions being anti-inflammatory, analgesic, um, and antimicrobial. Here, it's really the inflammatory component that we're using it for. I would say 250 to 500 milligrams twice a day. Melatonin um, really is only used if you can't sleep since you've been sick. It is a huge antioxidant and is very helpful here because there's an inflammatory process happening on the neurological level from the virus, and that's what's impeding sleep. So I don't recommend that everyone takes melatonin if they know or suspect they have COVID, but if you've, if you've, not been sleeping since you've been sick, you should try melatonin. Typically when we use melatonin, we're using very small doses, one to five milligrams for sleep. Here we're using 10 to 20 milligrams. We need much higher doses of the antioxidant um, in this case. So it's a bit, it's a bit different. And take that 30 to 60 minutes before bedtime. Turmeric or curcumin, one of our favorite anti-inflammatory herbs, at least 500 milligrams twice a day. Certainly you could do a thousand milligrams three times a day, very safe. And depending on your inflammatory state, or if you've had a particularly negative reaction, I would recommend the thousand milligrams three times a day. A baby aspirin of 81 milligrams. If you have a history of cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, strokes, clots, unmanaged, high blood pressure, definitely, or you had a D-dimer that was high, you definitely should consider taking the baby aspirin once a day. The natural version of baby aspirin are, um, there are some enzymes, natokinase, serapeptidase, um, there are a couple others, but natokinase is um, well studied in the literature as having anti-fibrinolytic activity, which means it can break up clots. And we know that microclots are a problem with COVID-19. So if you want to use natokinase, this is an enzyme that you can get over the counter. You want the strength of 2000 FUs, which is about 200 milligrams, at least twice a day. You could use that as an alternative to the baby aspirin. Glutathione, we talked about that for our you know, upper respiratory, getting rid of mucus, thinning mucus, detoxifying and protecting our lungs. Well, you could use NAC, which is N-acetylcysteine, the amino acid that's used, partially used to make glutathione, or you could use glutathione directly. Um, typical dosing, most um, NAC capsules, sorry, are about 600 milligrams. I would use two or three capsules a day. So it says 600 milligrams once or twice a day. Um, you could do two caps twice a day. That's a fine dose. Very safe. But also, um, it, you know, if you definitely, if you have that thick, sticky mucus, like that's <laughs> your symptom um, in the nose or in the throat or in the chest in the morning, that just will not relent. NAC or glutathione would be particularly indicated here. Um, two of my favorite treatments for uh, COVID have been ozone IVs and high dose vitamin C IVs for the same benefit of vitamin C that we talked about. It's highly antiviral and it really revs up our immune system and ozone because when we can do it in an IV form goes through every capillary, every blood surface, right? Killing the virus everywhere it can't hide. So those are two incredibly effective treatments as well. And it's not that you need to be doing all of these at the same time. You could definitely talk to your practitioner um, if you wanted to come up with a more complete plan, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't at least mention what we know, what we learned in the last year about COVID-19. Overall, I really just want to ask you to honor the process. I think it's, you know, it's amazing that we actually don't break down every second. Our bodies are so wonderfully complicated. Um, you know, we should be grateful that they're wise enough to 
to be able to heal themselves. And our job should be to allow our bodies to do what they already know to do rather than getting in the way, stand back, stand down or lie down and let our bodies heal in the ways that we know. I want you to be able to get to a place where you can thank your body for only getting sick maybe once or twice a year and only having a cold or a flu and not some deep internal illness in order, you know, and hopefully my goal is that you've, you know, found this webinar helpful. You've gained some tools, some dosing strategies, some natural natural therapies that you could start implementing for this cold and flu season to just help you be the healthiest version that you can be. So you continue to be at your best. Thank you so much for your time today. I look forward to speaking to you in other webinars and may you stay healthy.